Hello everybody, welcome to this month SCA seminar. Today's speaker is Don Morton and he's a research professor of computer science at the University of Alaska Arctic Region Supercomputing Center and he has recently launched a private venture Boreal Scientific Computing and uh, uh, this uh, venture is a mechanism for contributing operational forecasting expertise to a variety of organizations. He has a BS in computer science from College of Great Falls, Montana and a PhD from Louisiana State University. And he has spent his career trying to apply his talents in computer science to his passion for science and especially environmental sciences. Thanks. Test, test, now I'm on. Great, well, I'd like to uh, thank you for providing this opportunity to speak. I've uh, kind of bounced in the Mary Haley of, of the NCL group off and on over the years, and she and Dennis Shea had the opportunity to come up to Fairbanks last March to, to uh, give one of their on-the-road NCL classes, and we got to talking about Python and things we were doing, and um, she knew that I was um, going to be delivering a Python workshop in Vienna, Austria, at a meteorological service there, and she said, Don, well, you know, you're going to be down here in the summer anyway, why don't you give a presentation, and, and here I am. So um, thank you for coming. I, I've... Uh, as, as Tafid mentioned, I'm uh, my, by education, I'm, I'm a computer scientist. My passions have always been in the application of computer science to uh, the sciences. And as I used to tell my students, it's not the computer science that excites me, it's, it's the application. I've gone through the 10-year the promotion route at University of Montana, Missoula, and about five years ago decided I wanted to live on the edge and, and just go into the research professor um, area. And of course, that's a time when the funding just started to bottom out. And so a as a result, I'm, I'm sort of exploring other ventures here. And, and you'll hear about some of that. So an, an outline um, of what I'll talk about today is, is I'll, I'll talk about the operational activities that I and, and others have been pursuing for, for almost uh, a decade now. And, and I hope to impress upon you the evolution aspect, the idea that we start off, we want to run a simple model, we throw a bash script together, and it just gets more complicated and more complicated, and, and you need, need to start understanding ways to, to uh, manage this complexity. And I'm not saying I do a great job of it, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm evolving like everybody else. Um, I have a lot of slides. I don't know that we'll have time to go through all of them. I'll, I'll go through some examples of the application of, of Python and object-oriented programming to some of the things we do. I, you know, I'm assuming a very diverse background. Some of you may maybe um, know a lot more about Python than I do, but uh, please bear with me. And then I'll have a final slide just on, on some of uh, the ambitions here. So my beginnings in operational numerical weather uh, prediction began right in this room in January 2004. I, I came down from Missoula to attend an MM5 workshop. Uh, they, you know, they go around the room and they ask you, why are you here? And, and I told them truthfully, I'm here on vacation. I, I came down because I, I simply wanted to learn weather modeling. And they announced at this, um, at this, uh, this seminar or, or tutorial that it was going to be the last MM5 tutorial. And that, that we were going to start moving in the wharf. So I had to come back down in June and, and start uh, understanding wharf. But the beginnings here, um, really, I went home with, with, uh, with, with some of what I, I learned here, excited, and had a Windows, new Windows XP, one gigahertz machine, where I installed, um, maybe it's my phone, uh, where I installed uh, a, a Linux virtual machine, and, and then uh, ha had a free PGI compiler and, and ran Windows on it. And, and so that was sort of the first operational venture. This is the Pacific Northwest here, Washington, Idaho, Montana. Um, and then a uh, uh, little nest in here. Here's Idaho, Missoula's in here. And as many beginning uh, NWP people, I had, had a few artifacts here, about 150 millimeters of rain over Yellowstone Park on a daily basis. Um, um, but it, it was a start here. So, so um, we ended up moving this to a spare Linux machine at the University of Montana where we had a better network. Um, that autumn, I began uh, a, a sabbatical with the uh, working with the Missoula Weather Forecast Office. 
Uh, and some of you may know Gene Petrescu. He was the Sioux there at the time. Now, now he's in uh, Anchorage at, at Alaska Region Headquarters. And he had thrown together a, a very simple Linux cluster and had this dream of, of running a weather model on it. And here I was eager to do something like that. So we got along great. And so with simple bash scripting, uh, local web posting that uh, didn't go anywhere other than the weather service, we pushed out a forecast and uh, um, kind of up the notch, notches a little bit. Um, about that time, later in 2004, uh, a, a Cray actually came to Montana, of all places. And it actually was the first Cray in Montana. The uh, U.S. Forest Service Fire Simulation Lab, Fizzle, I believe they were called, uh, had purchased a small XD-1. And, uh, and it was housed at the National Weather Service office at, out, out at the airport. And so we had a usage agreement. And so we were able to use a good chunk of it uh, port our models to. And all of a sudden, things started getting a little more complicated. It was still Portland Group compilers, Linux, you know, all, all that good stuff. Um, but, but now we had a batch queuing system to worry about. We couldn't just, just run it uh, anytime we wanted. And so if you're doing this uh, through scripting, it, it gets more complicated. People wanted multiple runs per day. Uh, people started wanting this in AWIPS, which means the warp out files just aren't going to get you very far. Uh, we start. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, a AWIPS is is uh, it stands for Advanced Weather Interactive Prediction System. If you ever go to a forecast office, every um, forecaster has about four screens in front of them, and it's it's just a way to. I'll actually show you a, a picture of it in a minute, but it's just a way to show different models overlaid over each other, time stepping. It's uh, it's pure information overload. And, um, so, so my approach here was, was still sort of this monolithic, just a single script that starts with trying to get input data somewhere. Once the input data is in, we, we do the pre-processing that you do in WARF. And, uh, um, and it still it worked for a while. We were uh, um, putting out multiple nests and all. Some of these slides I'll, I'll fly through. In 2005, I, I had been, ARSC is the Arctic Region Supercomputing Center. I, I'd been collaborating with them since they, they started in 1993. And so I went to a Cray user group meeting to talk about what we had done in Montana. And they came and said, well, you know, we're getting ready to buy a Cray XD1. You should come up and, and start forecasting for Alaska. And that was an offer I couldn't refuse. And so I got up there, and the XD1 wasn't quite ready, but they had an IBM running at the same time. So the idea was, well, let's move this operational system to an IBM. And things get more complex. And uh, you, 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 you need to start understanding how to abstract some of your processes. Um, and, and so then once we got it running on the IBM, a few weeks later, we moved to the XD1, uh, had bigger runs. Uh, what one thing we certainly learned is, is that as we start pushing the computer, it's, it, uh, the CPUs aren't the limiting factor. The, the file systems tend to be. So we did Alaska forecast. At the time, we were just doing it for the uh, forecast office in Fairbanks, which, which is responsible for the northern half of Alaska, the area north of the Alaska range, and a lot of the marine environment. Uh, we started building some, some more interesting web products that, uh, that were going out on the public here. With, I mean, this is one of my favorite approaches for scrolling through, through a, a weather output. It's just mousing over the forecast hours. Um, in, in addition to uh, uh, those of you who run Wharf can see that we were using RIP at the time. Um, we were starting to learn how to poke into the wharf output files and pull out uh, particular station forecasts and, and allow users access to those. So the complexity increases. Um, we continued these runs over time. Missoula runs started uh, to come into high demand, and I'll explain why in, in a minute. The uh, weather service, particularly in Fairbanks, wanted more timely runs. So it wasn't just this matter of when, when we had the data run a 00z forecast, and then post-process the output. They wanted to start getting their 00z output around 00z, which is uh, um, better than NCEP does. <laughs> um, we're also doing multiple runs per day, and so now we're starting to crowd the supercomputer. And so, so we need to start thinking of each run sort of as a separate object that needs to be put in a separate place. Uh, we had nests and, and such on, on request, which I'll talk about later. 
And uh, all of a sudden, if we're doing all these runs, we actually have to start reserving certain processors just to get these runs going. Um, so one of the reasons these runs were so popular in, in Missoula was in the summertime, it turns out, and I mean, I'm a computer scientist, but sort of through a, um, a nice, happy coincidence, we were doing a pretty good job on forecasting convective activity. This was the 500 millibar relative humidity, which they used as a proxy for convective activity in the summer. Um, this is actually an AWIPS shot you know, from our model output uh, compared to the actual convective activity. And so forecasters started to think, hey, you know, this is good stuff. We need this. And so uh, now it's not a play thing anymore. People start to depend on what you're doing. Um, in, in Alaska, uh, we, we had some people from the, the United States Army who, who uh, do expeditions up to the top of Mount McKinley every summer decide that uh, they would like to have some, some uh, more high resolution forecasts just on the mountainous region. And so we did, I believe these were uh, one kilometer uh, forecasts for several different levels. Uh, and, and we just did that for a summertime. So that meant adjusting our model temporarily just to put these nest forecasts out for them. Um, as you're at a supercomputer center, as you move around the country, you're constantly migrating to new systems. Every system has, has its own peculiarities. Uh, performance issues come into play. You, you, you might set up your system on one supercomputer and, and, and you think everything's going to work well, and it turns out the Lustre file system isn't working well. And, and so, so then you end up having to move your part of your model maybe to another machine, so to speak. And, um, at the same time where we have to make room for other users on the machines, the complexity increases. In 2009, uh, Stan Benjamin, um, excuse me, Stan Benjamin came down from NOAA. Uh, he's with the, the NOAA GSD group working on the rapid refresh and the high resolution rapid refresh, previously the RUC, and suggested that they were doing a high resolution rapid refresh at three kilometers for the, the, uh, uh, the lower 48 and suggested that it might be interesting if we did sort of a, an analog in Alaska. So we kind of set this up uh, similarly to him. And this made it more complicated. I'll show you a, an approach in a minute. But essentially, we initialized the model with, uh, with, with his rapid refresh. But we used lateral boundary conditions from another model. So we, all of a sudden, we had a couple of uh, streams of processing going on. and. And this is sort of what it looks like here. And we're actually still doing this. Um, the, the, the idea is that the rapid refresh only goes out about 15 hours. I, I believe that's still the case. And, uh, but we wanted to do 24, 48-hour forecasts. So we would simply initialize with the rapid refresh and then use the boundary conditions from the 11-kilometer um, uh, from, from NAM. And we'd kind of uh, use. Uh, actually, a tool from the WARF data simulation package, WARF DA, to ramp our NAM boundary conditions to sort of match the uh, um, the rapid refresh boundary conditions uh, at, at at the initialization time. So all of a sudden, now we have two streams of of processes going on that that, that we have to keep track of, and uh, um, we merge them at some point. We we run WARF uh, as we're running WARF. Simultaneously, we've got processes out there that are looking at the WARF output files. And as soon as one comes into play, producing GRIB files for, for the, the National Weather Service. And then there's a lot of post-processing going on. This is your, your AWIPS shot. Um, so th uh, the way this is distributed in Alaska is we produce the, uh, the, the, the GRIB files for the entire region in, in chunks at the University of Alaska. And uh, they're always complaining about the network at the Weather Service in Alaska. So we, we essentially put our files on an LDM server, uh, ship them, or, or Anchorage uh, regional office grabs them. Uh, George Trojan down there sort of chops them up into different regions. Uh, Anchorage keeps one of them, ships the chopped files to Fairbanks, the others to Juno, so they can essentially bring our model input into their AWIPS here. And, and again, this is just one screenshot from their AWIPS, where in this case, they might be looking at four different models, time-stepping them simultaneously so they can see the, the differences. Um, in 2010, uh, 
received some, some DTC support uh, two months, uh, in, in fact, to in, enhance our, our operational system by using, one, the model evaluation tools to start building an infrastructure to, to verify our forecasts. We started doing some sounding verifications, longer term summaries. And then we also started experimenting with another one of the DTC products, the grid point statistical interpolation uh, or GSI data assimilation system. So the work with DTC just made this all even more complicated. Remember that little post-processing box I had in the upper right of one of the previous slides? Well, that's this here. And uh, all of a sudden, now we've, uh, um, th this is sort of our, the product of the WARF output, the WARF out files. Well, they end up needing to be converted to a GRIB1 format. We also need to be ingesting observations if we're going to do, do, a, do, a, do a verification. And then uh, MET, if you haven't used that, it's, it's a, a very powerful tool. I haven't explored it in depth for some time. But there are tools in there that will essentially allow you to combine the observations and interpolate point forecasts within your GRIB file and then statistically compare them. And with the output there, you can produce all sorts of, uh, of, of interesting outputs. And we did that at the same time. We also um, used our wharf out files to extract forecast soundings and compare them with the actual RAOBS uh, data that, that you can get from the University of Wyoming site. And so we built uh, um, interfaces here that would allow us to select particular forecasts, particular products from each forecast. Uh, uh, using R and such, I won't spend much time on this. Uh, able to, to uh, we, we archive this data forever. Uh, we do have great storage systems, so we could start performing some, some longer term verifications, seasonal and such. And then with our RayOBS verifications, again, we could take uh, the actual weather balloon uh, observations from, from the University of Wyoming site. You can get them in a text format, parse those, compare those with the uh, the soundings we extract from our forecast data and use NCL driven by Python uh, to produce some comparison plots here. Um, getting this down below minus 30 is still a challenge that I haven't addressed yet, but that it's an issue in places like Alaska. I'll also produce various web products, including a, um, um, an, an, an iPhone application, which uh, one of the forecasters in Juno uh, like to call um, a model in his pocket. Um, and, and then one of the um, other things that, that we've, uh, we did through the DTC funding and, and a little bit of NASA funding was to at least start experimenting with assimilation of, of surface observations and uh, some, some uh, NASA uh, provided uh, satellite soundings. We uh, essentially had to modify our flow here. So again, it starts to get complex. And after our, our merge state here, rather than, than pushing our input files straight in the wharf, we would then uh, take our observations, surface observations and satellite soundings, uh, perturb our initial conditions with GSI, come up with a new input package for wharf, and then run that. This is considered a cold start. We also experimented with some of the warm start methods where we use the results of a previous forecast and perturb that with observations. Um, and so along with that came products. Um, is, uh, NCL, again, I've always been a great fan of that um, for, for comparing our HURAC against the, um, the, the errors assimilation and, and diff plots and such. So, um, and then we also compared the soundings between the HURAC and, and the errors assimilation. So, so that's sort of the wharf work we've been doing. Uh, more recently, we've been expanding outwards. I uh, had, had one of the pri privileges of my, my life uh, was to uh, work as a consultant for the UN in Vienna at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of their, their models in a minute. Um, that sort of drove uh, myself and my colleague Delia in the back to explore some, some, some operational smoke forecasts, which could also be used for other applications. So in terms of these, uh, these operational backward simulations, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization has about 80 sensors throughout the world where they, they measure um, aerosols, things, radionuclides and such. And then they, they take 
and, and I never knew you could do this until about two years ago. They take these, these Lagrangian particle dispersion models, transport models, and they run them backwards. They just turn the wind backwards. And so in a sense, um, uh, at this point, we, we were taking a measurement from a site in Argentina, taking the model and running it backwards. And so over the time, the, the plume starts to give you an indication of potential source regions for uh, for that emission. And, and if you have 80 of these, these sites around the world, you, um, and you might be able to help pinpoint an irregular emission. So these were run operationally, they are run operationally um, every day in Vienna, and so we got involved with, with this particular model, and that led us to, um, this next slide might take a bit to load because it's animated. Let's try it once more. Yeah, so we, we kind of um, took this, and uh, and of course you can run these models in forward mode, and, and started doing some some prototype wildfire smoke runs in Alaska. The, uh, what, I don't know whether it's an advantage or or not, but we often let our fires burn in Alaska. There's if there aren't any structures to worry about, so it, it's it's a great place to to model smoke. And uh, so, so we, we set up another operational system to, to do this, where we're ingesting GFS for other purposes anyway. We need to ingest some emissions data. And um, we, we also need to take results of a previous run uh, to keep the smoke alive. And again, we were running this four times a day every six hours. Um, this took uh, Deli and I a, a few weeks to implement. But then, um, I believe it was uh, last May, uh, we heard about this fire in, in Catalonia, where, where Delia is from, and we started thinking, well, you know what, you already have this Alaska model. You know, let's see if we can just uh, try to model this in Catalonia, too. And, and really, because we've really built a maturity in our tools, we were able to, to get this operational model out there and running four times a day um, in, in about two hours. And, uh, oops. And, and so, now where we're going with, with some of these models is, is one of our long-term operational visions here is uh, particularly in, in the context of modeling plumes and, and such is there are multiple models out there that uh, do a reasonable job of modeling plumes and, and what we really want is, is a way to, to run them in, in a somewhat identical setup and to compare the outputs in an identical setup and, and that's the hard part flex part has its own way of displaying output high split another. And so we're, we've actually been building Python tools that will allow us to transform the output, sort of like the, the, the wharf paradigm of taking uh, input and converting it to a standard intermediate format and then having a single tool convert that. So we've sort of been uh, applying that with, uh, with trying to um, um, come up with, uh, w with a way of modeling multiple model outputs in the same way. Volcanic ash transport is a big deal. So um, uh, finally, what, what uh, we're doing here at, at DTC is, is we're taking the, the, uh, the new operational modeling system from NCEP, the No Environmental Modeling System, NMMB, which, which is sort of an offshoot of WARF. Um, and and your, your North American mesoscale model uh, runs the NMMB now, and we're trying to put this over Alaska, and we've just succeeded in doing this in kind of an operational sense. So a lot of different models here running in different ways, different complexities. And so this has sort of led to some software engineering perspectives over the years here. And uh, the, the idea here is, is that we've, we've started with these very simple bash scripts, as many of, of us do, to, to what I consider one of the fundamental concepts of software engineering is to, uh, try, to try to build things into a loosely coupled component fashion here. And uh, you know, just uh, I told you I was going to skip over some slides here. Um, to the, um, th this idea of loosely coupled Python components really comes back to the, the Unix philosophy here. In, which, uh, which, which one suggests that, that programs are built from very simple components and they communicate fairly easily. Um, the, uh, 
the idea is that developers should, should write programs that communicate easily with other programs. That way you can take a huge project and, and modularize it into um, to components that, that one can easily handle. And um, going on here, I, I think we've all seen this, uh, uh, th this, this idea of being able to chain simple Unix components through a pipe system. Well, that, that's sort of the, uh, the philosophy that we're, we're trying to adapt in our, in our um, uh, operational programming now. So when we have a system, ideally, it's built up of loosely coupled cohesive components. Loose coupling and cohesiveness are, 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 um, are attributes we talk about in software engineering. The idea is that each one of our components, whether it be fetching input data, whether it be pre-processing a certain form of data, is, is we, we try to self-contain it within a single component. That's the cohesiveness. And most importantly, we try to minimize the interactions that a component makes with another component. We try to target them into maybe a, a single stream data flow so that when we do modify one component, as we will, we're not going to necessarily have to modify other components. And I mean, you can even take this a step further and think of components running on different machines and different programming languages. And so, again, that, that is the paradigm that we've, we've kind of adopted here. And I'm just going to go through a couple of steps. Um, let's see here. And, and one here is, is just, if, if we're going to do a 0z forecast, one of the, the fundamental steps here is to grab input data to drive our forecast. We have two different streams. And we have to start asking ourselves some questions here. We, we've got two sources, one of them is every six hours, one is hourly. And the problem is you can't always count on the sources being there at the same time. So we need to have a mechanism to keep trying, but we don't want to try forever. Um, we, we need to know when a remote file is complete. I mean, we can write a bash script that just tries to get the file. And if the file isn't complete, as often happens, well, then you, you lost your whole forecast here. Um, so. Um, there are some ways to actually, and, and some servers will allow you to actually probe uh, through FTP and get the file size first, and, and then uh, uh, you, you can download it. But the point is you, you need some mechanism to, to verify whether your data is coming in in its completeness, and if not, uh, maybe loop around and try it again and again, but, but not, not forever. And, um, and, and so th this... Uh, involves setting up several parameters here that, uh, and this is just all user policy. How long are we going to wait before trying to uh, see if a file size is a certain size? You know, the problem is we can start fetching a, a file as it's being produced, but it hasn't finished yet. So uh, we sometimes want to go back and give it time. Um, another step here is, is once we have our input files, well, one of the fundamental steps in the WARF processing is to sort of interpolate them to your grid of interest here. And again, we have to do that twice. So again, some of the questions that come into play, particularly in an operational environment here, is that um, if we're doing a 0z forecast, we actually need to run this MET grid at 20z. So right off the bat, we can't use 0z GFS or, or NAM input for our model run. We have to go back six hours. And then we have to consider what if the input data isn't there yet. Well, we need we need to get things rolling. We 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 can try you know for a little while, but at some point we have to make a decision. And so we might decide, okay, well if the 18z or well obviously the 0z data isn't there. If the 18z input data isn't there, maybe the 12z is probably there. Maybe we want to start our forecast at forecast hour 12 of the 12z. Uh, input just to get something going. And, you know, these are decisions you have to make. These are trade-offs. Um, in, in the merge case, we, uh, we again, the idea here is that we want to initialize from the rapid refresh. We want to use the NAM for our lateral, lateral boundary conditions. We need those outputs by a certain time if they're not available. And that's often the case, particularly the, the RAP here is run at NOAA on an experimental basis, so we can't always count on it coming in. So we might wait and try again, but we could also 
um, do something as sort of a switch over here where if we've already ingested the NAM, well, maybe we could just decide at the last minute to use that as, as our initialization. Again, it's a policy decision. It's a trade-off we make. Um, finally, in terms of the, our, our grid production here, we, uh, the, the forecast offices want these grid products as soon as possible. And so one of our, we have this, we, we run wharf, it's, it's, uh, and a few minutes after wharf starts running through a cron tab, we actually start another process that monitors wharf out files. And as, as soon as uh, an expected one comes, comes in the bean and is the proper size uh, that we expect, then we start firing up processes to create grib files and push those to an LDM server. Um, we used to do this in kind of a, a, a single program that would loop through our desired output fields. And, um, and the pipeline would always get clogged. There was always one or two fields that just slowed things down. And I tried to juggle them around forever. And so I finally, just last spring, adopted another paradigm where for each one of our uh, our fields, we simply launch a process that handles them, and they just sort of they bash against each other. But the scheduling actually works out pretty well. You're not having one uh, just just hold up uh, all of the others. Okay, um, let's keep going here. So I'll sort of so you've seen the complexity here. You, you've seen this idea that we're trying to do things in a a, uh, a loosely coupled fashion here. And that sort of led us to Python over the years. It's been a natural evolution for me. There's actually a good article in the December, it's only a page long, uh, in December uh, BAMS, uh, sort of motivational about the use of Python. And one of the quotes in here is that Python is executable pseudocode. I, uh, I, yeah, I, as someone who taught computer science for years, I'm a proponent of code that's readable. It's I mean, somebody's going to have to come play with it. You're going to have to go back to it a year or two later, and and half the time, if if you haven't made the effort initially, you're going to have a hard time remembering what you were doing. So Python is it's the language is such that it's fairly natural, and just the statements themselves can, unlike C, can can give you a lot of insight into what's going on. It's interpreted, of course, and and object oriented, open source, and extremely par uh, portable. I've um, I, I don't run it on Windows, but uh, you know, any any Unix machine I've gone to, I, I, I don't think I've ever had an issue with with portability of the Python programs here. So Python is a, it's a general purpose, high level programming language. Uh, a lot of this this operational programming is done with Bash or, or Perl. I mean, you know, Perl's okay, but it's it's pretty low level. And when you're talking about handling complexity, I mean, I really think you need to start thinking about object orientation here. Um, Python does support multiple paradigms, and I'm uh, primarily object-oriented and, and imperative here. Um, Python, it, it's, it's like some, some other programming environments. MPI used to be described like this. With just a handful of statements, you can do everything you want. And then the rest is just you learn it as you go along, and you can start doing things more efficiently, more, more concisely. But it, it's, it's very easy to get started doing things in Python. And some of the core philosophies in, in the community here, um, I won't really go through those. But I, I like this quote here by one of the, the um, uh, um, Python uh, activists here, is that we in computer science often love to do things that are clever and nobody else understands them. That makes us feel even better about it. But really, I've always felt, and I agree with this, that some, describing something as clever, it's, it's not a compliment in this culture here. You need something that's readable, that's maintainable. Um, I won't go, I, I think if you don't know, uh, Python came from, from uh, um, Rossum's uh, aff affection for Monty Python's Flying Circus. Uh, Python 2 has, has been out for a while. Python 3 was released recently. I'll just say a little bit about 2 versus 3. Um, I, I haven't even programmed with Python 3 other than, than just on an academic uh, example level. Python 3 was the first ever intentionally backward incompatible language. They felt like there, there were just enough fixes, um, enough issues in, in Python 2 that they'd rather start from scratch and, uh, and not try to make Python 3 operate on Python 2. So Python 2.7 is, is the last um, um, supported version here. Python 3 is under active development. And, and as I understand it, 
Um, it's becoming more and more backwards compatible. I, I, I mean, I think that's pretty strong now. I just haven't experienced it myself. But there are some areas here, and Python imaging library, if you're doing operational graphics and such, might be of importance to you. Apparently, um, still isn't supported in, in Python 3. And so my opinion, is, as I mentioned to these people in Austria, is, is that you know, maybe you want to start considering Python 3 but Python 2 is, is still it's, it's sort of your stable best bet if you want something that's, that's portable. Um, th this is actually um, when I actually looked at this book when, when I was uh, getting ready for this, this workshop in Austria here. And they talk about Python's beautiful heart. They talk about eight components here. But uh, again, some of what they suggest here is that Python is very rich with features. I, I mean, it's overwhelming if you just go to the Python library. There, there's so much in there. But again, understanding a few key features will let you do almost anything you want. Uh, and then you can learn the rest as, as you go through it. Um, some of the key features here. I'm going to focus. The data types are dynamic. I think I might have an example in here. Um, I'll talk about this object orientation. You can collect. Uh, have collections of data in, in various different formats. Of course, I can't teach you Python right now. Um, but I'm going to sort of focus on the object implementation here. And, and many of you may have already do object-oriented programming. But the idea behind Python is that everything is an object. Even that integer 2 is considered an object. Then They're sort of equal here. And an object, as I used to teach it, there's actually three attributes. But the, the one that I, I think is most interesting to, to a beginning programmer is its ability to abstract a set of data and the operations on that data. And I'll show you a couple of examples in a minute here. And if you can do that, if you can do it correctly, you can really ease the task of programming. And uh, um, just to kind of show you here uh, that, uh, that everything in Python is an object, uh, this is just a simple integer assignment. A assign the value 1, 8. And you can use a uh, Python call uh, function, the dir, which will allow you to look at all of the possible functions or methods that could be used to uh, um, operate with or on this particular piece of data here. So this is indeed an object. And you can actually start digging into those various methods if you want. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, the dynamic typing uh, uh, makes things very flexible here. So um, you might have an integer assignment, A assign the value 7. This can actually vary from implementations of Python. But, but in general, the approach is going to be that this is already an object. And, and some implementations of Python will recognize, well, this object already exists. So let's just have B also point to that. And that can get you into trouble with more complicated um, data structures. And then you can just as easily, because of the dynamic typing, say that now A is just a pointer to another object that holds the string flex part in it. So um, you're not uh, doing this, this strict typing as some of you may be used to in the Fortran, C, even the Java world. This doesn't belong here, but we'll, we'll see it again in a minute. Um, talking a little bit more about modules and object-oriented programming, uh, when I used to teach uh, um, uh, beginning Python for, for science students at University of Montana. Um, I kind of gave them these examples here, where uh, one of the, the primary data structures in Python is just a list of objects. And they don't even have to be the same type. They can be numbers and strings. And so we think of a list object, again, as an object. It has data. Uh, you don't care how it's stored uh, if, if you're on the outside using this. And it has certain operations or methods that allow you to access the data. And they also protect you from manipulating the data. And so as a simple example here, we can uh, create one object called groceries. And all of a sudden, it's, uh, um, th th this is the stuff that's in our grocery list. We don't really care how it's stored in there. And there are various operations that will allow us to add things into the list. We can look at the list. And we can do the same thing. This is also an object list. And we can, uh, um, again, create a second object that, that contains other items. And then we can manipulate it in various ways. So, so I kind of took this and, and tried to bring out a meteorological example for students here. And the idea was to, to build a, uh, an object 
that would store and allow for, for simple access, this is just an academic example, to, um, to meteorological observations for a particular location here. And so the idea here was, was that uh, Met Fetcher was sort of a class definition, so you could have one object for Missoula observations, another for Fairbanks, and I'll show you that in a minute. And <clears throat> again, it's the classic design structure of, of an object. We have data, and we have certain operations in this case, an academic example, just to get the list of times for the operations, the, uh, the temperature, and, and another method that would allow us to, to graph them. And so the idea here is, is we think of this Met Fetcher as kind of a black box. I mean, somebody had to go in there and program it, and, and you may too. But if you're using it, you, it's, it's a perfect abstraction here. Uh, the idea here was, was that we would instantiate it or initialize it with the string of, a, of a, an airport identifier, Missoula or, or Fairbanks. And behind the scenes, this object, as it was starting up, would go out on the internet and grab the, the, the particular observations you wanted. And then you could actually access them with the get times and the get TC, graph TC. So if, if you're retrieving observations regularly, this was a good way to abstract them. And then behind the scenes, just to impress people what was really happening, I mean, this is actually how the data was being stored. I was simply grabbing them off of a website here. I mean, you can see the, the, the tag right there. And, and then I had methods inside, for, for example, to get the times that would go through and get the, extract the times out of here, extract the temperature, um, uh, another one. Um, and so, for example, I could instantiate Missoula. I could get a list of times by simply calling the times method, the temperature, and so on. Or could even abstract it even more and simply plot it. So again, this is a, the whole idea here is to abstract complicated uh, operations here. Um, again, this comes from the, uh, the Vienna Austria workshop. The, um, I, one of their first labs here, I, I had prepared an object for them to, to grab some satellite data. Uh, they were actually uh, radiant MODIS data that, uh, that some would use as a proxy, uh, first proxy for fire emissions here. And the idea is that uh, there's a web page you can go to. It, it's a NASA page. You can select a particular region of the world, and, and there are text files available for 24, 48 hours. And, and, and even archives and such. And the idea is we wanted to build a, an object similar to this Met Fetcher that would allow people to simply grab the fire radiances for a region they were interested in and then immediately use them in, in their model rather than having to go through, through a lot of the complexity here. Um, so the idea is this web page will allow you to, um, to actually find out where these aren't necessarily fires, but, but these are hot spots as, as detected by MODIS. You could zoom in on places. And the key features we were interested in, it's hard to see here, are the location, the latitude, longitude, and what they call the fire radiance power, which we would use as a proxy for, for emissions. Uh, this is what the raw data look like. Again, we, we didn't want users of this to have to deal with the complexity of this raw data. So our role here was to simply abstract it and simply um, read this data and package it into an object for the user. So the idea here was, was that we created a, an object. This is the data. And these are the particular methods that would operate on the data. This is the user's interface to the data. And they could do things like, like print the listing. They, if they grabbed European data, they could actually zoom in a little bit closer and specify a bounding box. And then they could actually get a, a list of, of just that particular region. And so some sample usage was uh, um, we, we had defined the class called firms. Uh, the, these were just URLs to the actual files for EU and Alaska source data. I was just showing how you could um, have um, several different objects coming from the same class. And so we would simply instantiate or initialize our European data by plugging in the URL. And this class behind the scenes would go and fetch the data, put it in that data portion for us, ready for us to use the, um, the, the methods that are provided. And so once we have stuff in this Alaska object, we could print a full listing. 
We could decide that maybe we just wanted to specify a bounding box within our EU data. So um, we define the bounding box, pass that into our object here, and then we can simply print the, uh, um, the, 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 the components of that object. And we can even go so far as to plot where the particular regions are. So, so, so that's a quick introduction to, to why we're interested in Python and, and particularly the object-oriented capabilities provided by Python. Obviously, I can't teach it to you here. Um, the last part here is I'm just simply going to go through some, some uh, uh, excerpts of, of code that we've used uh, to, to do several things in our operational systems. Mary Haley said she was particularly interested in and how we use this with, with NCL and, and also with matplotlib. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this first one. I'll just say briefly that because we use different computing systems with different batch submission systems, and Yellowstone is one of them now, and uh, that's one of the harder ones, um, it, it, it's different enough. What we, we've sort of abstracted the, uh, the, um, idea, the Kate process of submitting a job into a supercomputer now uh, in behind the scenes. And so, for example, we, we have a class that we've called batch job where we simply pass in sort of what we want to call it and a particular name for the machine. This was a machine in Alaska uh, with four core nodes. Uh, there's a particular way to submit jobs there. And so we simply have this, this job, it's an object. It has data and it has methods to operate on the data, but ultimately it allows us to, um, to submit our job from a very high level abstract way. We can set the number of cores and such. We can uh, put a couple of statements in there. And then ultimately we can issue a blocking submit. And that's all the, the user from a high level perspective needs to know to submit the job to, to Yellowstone or, or, or a Cray in, in Minnesota or whatever. And of course, behind the scenes, it's, it's more complicated. And I won't get into the detail, but this is just some of the steps that we have to go into to actually make all of that work for this particular machine. But that's the beauty, is we, we've hidden the abstraction, or we've hidden the details behind this particular abstraction here, where we simply set it up and, and submit. That's the power of, of uh, one of the, the benefits of object-oriented programming. OK, so um, uh, we've produced a lot of images over the years. And I, I've been a great fan of NCL, um, primarily because most of our outputs, uh, our models have, have been WARF models. And NCL, is, especially with the WARF group, is really powerful on allowing us to get what we want out of a WARF file and, and derive other data. Um, but I, I've never really, um, I hope I don't make enemies, I've never really liked programming in NCL, it's, uh, particularly if, if you're used to abstraction and object orientation. And, uh, and, and I'll be the first to admit I'm no expert in NCL, and, and I, uh, you know, I've missed a, a, a lot of it. But I've, I've always felt like I, I want to use NCL for what I think it's good for, for extracting data and plotting it. But I want something higher level to actually manage all these WARF out files and such. And so for producing uh, uh, GIF images for, uh, for a particular uh, model run, um, at the top level here, I've got something that's just a driver, a Python program. And uh, it actually, um, I have lots of common definitions in, in another uh, Python uh, module here. And I've got a bunch of NCL scripts. I could even put these together in different ways. Um, but for example, if I, if I want to get the DBZ over, the, the max DBZ over the full domain, my GIF driver would call this. Uh, maybe I, I just want uh, local temperature over a particular region. I can call it in a different way. And so from an NCL perspective, one of the things I have loved most about it is, is, is that you know, we can drive the programs by passing in environment variables. So I can um, give it a WARF out file. This would actually come from my Python program. I would set this, this variable. Likewise, what I'm going to name the image in the particular region. So for example, I might want to just do a, uh, a box over the Juno area, uh, maybe the Fairbanks area. And so um, if I can define this stuff outside of NCL, then NCL can do the hard work of extracting the data from a WARF out file and, and plotting it in, in a very nice way. And from the Python perspective, 
Um, this is actually more complicated than I would make it now. Like I say, a lot of this stuff is evolutionary. You could look at it later. Um, but the idea is, uh, for a particular domain here, I essentially um, start to uh, make some decisions here about whether it's going to be a full domain or local. I specify where my NCL script is. For every one of my files in my wharf out file list, very intuitive structure here, I can start to um, set up my environment variables uh, that are going to be passed into NCL. I can ultimately um, uh, set up a command that I'm going to execute. And once that's done, um, I can actually uh, convert that to a GIF and even animated GIFs and all. Um, Python is, it's, uh, the core Python is not well designed for numerical operations and, uh, or visualization, but, but uh, Python ha has, has many libraries available in the community. And uh, I'll, very, I'll go quickly through this here. Is, is, um, and this is confusing if you, if you try to figure this out. And I tried to figure this out before this Vienna course. There used to be a package called numeric that would improve Python for array operations. And it was stable, but became obsolete. There was also something called numeric, which was a, a rewrite of numeric. It became deprecated. SciPy came along, and it was meant to take the best of numeric and numarray. And part of that was separated into something called NumPy. And NumPy seems to be, be what, what's used for numerical operations now in, in later versions of Python. Um, the idea is, is that NumPy will work with arrays and matrices in a natural way. It's a huge list of available functions. If you have LayPack, you can actually optimize. And uh, um, it, it does tend to be cleaner than native Python. I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples. In, in fact, I'll just show you by example here. Um, this is something I picked out of, uh, of, of uh, um, a Kindle I, I, book I downloaded here, um, showing the uh, just initialization and summation of two vectors in Python or NumPy. And, and in Python, you, uh, you might uh, initialize this array. This just gives you a list of integers from 0 up to n minus 1, and likewise b. Have an empty list c. So these are all three lists here. And they're not necessarily they're, they're objects, which means they store numbers in this case. But they're also set up so they could store other lists or complicated objects. So, so they're not optimized for numerical operations. But at each point here, for each value of i, we could square and cube it. And then we could append the sum to, to our list c. And, and we'd have our result. Or you could do it more concisely in NumPy, where we simply um, uh, do the square all at once, uh, likewise with b. And we simply add the vectors in a single uh, function and, and return it. And in addition to the code being concise, I haven't tried this myself, but apparently it's very efficient. And you can see the numbers here. Um, for, for n of 4,000, uh, sort of an order of magnitude faster by using NumPy. And uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned here is you can also have your Python programs uh, call uh, Fortran and, and C routines for even more optimization. OK, so, so matplotlib is something that we've been starting to use a lot of. I, I'm still not in a position where I would use it for WARF, for WARF because I love NCL for its WARF handling capabilities. You just you can't beat it, really, I think. Um, but but there, there are other um, things that, that uh, we, we've been finding useful with, with uh, matplotlib. And the fact that it is Pythonic um, makes us feel more comfortable with it. And uh, um, simple. Simple example here is if we have a Python program, we can import the, the matplotlib functionality. It's meant to be something like uh, matlib or, or matlab. Uh, and we, we can very easily plot a line and, and much more. One thing, a component that comes alongside of matplotlib is base map, which now allows us to start doing geographical sorts of things here. Um, it's, it's, I, I'm not much of a MATLAB user, but it's apparently similar to the mapping toolbox there. It doesn't plot on its own, but it uh, allows us to transform coordinates to different projections. And then matplotlib would work with that to actually plot the data on it. And this is one example of, of just plotting a map uh, using Python and, uh, and base map and such. Lots of importing here. 
But essentially, we define the map, the projection, the resolution. This sort of is, is an area threshold. Uh, uh, features less than 1,000 kilometers, uh, uh, sorry, 1,000 meters will, will be ignored and sort of a bounding box. We can easily add certain features to this object. This map is just an object that we're going to invoke methods on. Uh, we can even do some interesting blue marble backgrounds, shaded relief backgrounds, as I think you might have seen in some of my examples. Um, very powerful to use. This is sort of an example of, of some of what we've done here. And I'm going to show you a quick example of using matplotlib to just plot a couple of GFS fields uh, using a, a couple of libraries here. And this, this is just quick excerpts here, leaving a lot out here. But there's a library called GribAppy from ECMWF uh, that, uh, that, that allows, that has a Python interface that allows you to extract features uh, from your Grib file. Um, and so the idea is we, we import a bunch of objects again, uh, read in some arguments, ultimately open our MET file. Um, in this case, we're visualizing wind, which means we have to uh, turn on support for visualizing both U and V, or, or multiple field support. And you know this isn't the cleanest code. This was experimental. But the basic idea is that uh, we, we're going to just iterate through all of the fields in that GRIB file. And when we hit upon the 10 meter U, we'll go ahead and get some of the attributes out of there. Uh, for example, the, the, the grid and such, the, the bounding box. And, um, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll store that in a data structure that we can pass into a function. Um, likewise, when we hit V, uh, we've already got all this data for U. When we hit V, all we really need to do is extract the grid using this, this grid appy object. And then we can go ahead and plot it here with our create wind frame. And did I give you, and, and the wind frame here essentially takes the some some grid information, this this dictionary that I had passed in, the two grids, some other information. We uh, we set up our map. For, uh, for, for the, the particular uh, region we're interested in. This is just how much thinning we want. Add features to it. We need to extract latitudes and longitudes um, for the particular um, <coughs> uh, projection we're interested in. Uh, we also need to extract x and y values in meters. Uh, the map, base map needs that. We thin our, um, our, our original grid, which, which had the, the, the U and the V in it. And ultimately, um, this, this does the plotting, and we're good to go. And I, I mean, I know I, I threw that at you here. And this is kind of what you can end up with. Um, I'll skip over flex part here, but it's just uh, the flex part is one of those Lagrangian particle dispersion models where it just comes out in a bunch of files, and uh, um, we can use map. Python and matplotlib to go through each one of those files and, and extract plumes. Again, I'm not gonna, I won't go through the details on this because I'm going to get just about time to quit. And so I'm going to sort of end here with, with one of my favorite uh, Python uh, tools. It, and uh, it's something I just stumbled on some years ago. And the idea is that in our complicated operational environments, we have things running at different times on different machines, doing different things. And when things go wrong, <laughs> it's not fun. It's you know, trying to figure out where things might have gone wrong. Of course, every process prints a log file. They're on different machines. Um, again, uh, we might do four forecasts a day. You have to find the right log file. Um, and, and so a couple of years ago, I was starting to think, you know, what, what we need is some server that that every process could send the logging message to and, and identify it. And then you could go through this. And I was starting to think about how to write it. And all of a sudden, I stumbled on this. And it was exactly what I wanted. Um, and, and the idea here is, is that uh, uh, that server ha has, a, has a minimal uh, web server associated with it, which will receive messages from processes on different machines. And so, for example, uh, and you can color code this any way you want. You can classify the, the level of the message, whether it's an error or a warning, uh, the time that it happened. So important events, whether they're good or bad, get logged here. And, and you can just start to see it all on one page. It's, it's still not easy to follow, but at least it's all in one location. And um, it, it all 
comes from, from this website here where uh, it, it consists of a Python uh, built, a Python based server that, that uh, a typical user can, can install. You, you have to get the system administrator to set up a port for you and a monitor that again will, will give you that, that web display. And then it's up to you to build client uh, functionality to send messages to this server. And that's not very hard to do. Um, and actually, as I was looking for this um, a few months ago, or, uh, before this, this Austria workshop, I actually, I'd forgotten that uh, <laughs> I was actually one of their best proponents of this. It really, it's, it's a good piece of software. It's, it's something that did what would have taken me weeks and months to do, and uh, literally less than a day I was able to um, set up my operational system so that everything was sending messages to this single server. Um, and setting it up was very simple here. It's, it's simply quick question. Uh, yes. Do they use their own protocol as they go back and forth, or are they using a standard logging protocol and just making it? Um, I don't know. I I don't know. Um, I, I I actually I I think there there was a standard logging mechanism in here. Maybe we can't see it, but I I remember some of, some of their imports here actually came from sort of standard Python packages. Um, so, so it was fairly simple to build a class logger client here, um, and so every process could simply, in this case, um, set up a, a tag uh, for for the client here. And anytime something important happens, you create a message, you push it into this this logger. Whether log info is is an information type of message versus a log error, and that'll send it to the server, and and you're good to go. So another great way to abstract things. Okay, last slide here. I, I know this has been, been a little disjointed here. Is some of the things that, uh, that, that uh, we're starting to look at is, one, I live in a cron tab hill. All of these processes you saw, I still haven't gotten around this. I, I, I work on multiple machines. I have, and, and these are machines, you know, unlike NOAA, that, where everything is Zulu, these are machines where you have to switch between daylight and standard time. And so twice a year I have to go in there and shift everything, and there's always a mistake. And, and I, I mean, it's really a nightmare to handle. Um, and, and so, and I've looked around. If you, if you guys know of something, please let me know. I've, I, I've looked around and never seen something that would fit the bill. There are some crude packages that'll help you create a cron tab from a high-level perspective. But what I, you know, we really need is some tool that will simply build and or modify your cron tabs on different machines for a single system. And uh, that's something we're going to be looking into. Um, because we're doing more of these, these smoke and maybe even nuclear and volcanic ash simulations, we're, we're starting to build components that will allow us to run multiple models like FlexPart and HighSplit and Puff and volcanic ash dispersion uh, simultaneously at the push of a button. You know, you're in bed, a volcano goes off. You want something to start those models running in a certain domain. So by the time people get to work, there are multiple outputs available in, in sort of an ensemble format for people to look at. Um, and then one other aspect that uh, just beginning to look at is that of, of cloud computing here. It's, uh, um, it's supercomputing, supercomputing centers aren't always the best option for trying to do something operational. And so we're, um, NCEP has been investigating this. I just tuned into a seminar of theirs the other day. I don't know that you're going to see real hardcore operational things taking place in the cloud because they aren't as efficient, but, but it is a direction people are starting to look at for handling some of those operations. And so with that sort of seemingly um, short ending, that, that's what I have for you today. So, thank you. Questions? Well, I start. Have you looked at any of uh, you know Swift or Eclipse uh, as a, using as a workflow management? No, I, I I was exposed to one at NCEP last summer. I, they just called it Workflow Manager, and and I just didn't feel like that fit the bill on well, one. I think it was written in Perl, isn't it? Um, Ruby? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I had a hard time dealing with it. It, it. it might be a tool, but I haven't looked in depth at it. Um, 
Yeah, that, do, you, do you feel there are workflow managers out there? That well, what I've seen is always something that kind of works, but yeah, and and truly not really. And I feel like everybody is kind of duplicating the same effort, like you mentioned at the beginning of the school talk. I guess the best. And, uh, you know, everybody can sort of reinvent the wheel, and but it's not quite in a state of, uh, I can share what I did to others, so it works for me okay when it doesn't break. Uh, and I can fix it when it breaks, so with a fair, not too much effort, but I can give it to another person mm -hmm. reliable. And my, I'm not sure if you're uh, sharing what you've done outside your own team of your plan to. Um, we have, but it, it's, it's, we don't, again, you know, I live in a cron tab hell. I, I don't think any of you want me to share that, you know. But we, we have particular modules that do things well that, that, that uh, we, we've certainly shared and such. And in terms of, uh, you know, for example, the uh, job submission part mm -hmm. that you are abstracting that yeah, way. Yeah, that's. Um, are you currently sharing it, or do you have any plans? I, to I haven't, that? but if somebody sends me an email, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly amenable to, to sharing with them. Okay. Question. So, uh, designing real-time systems is really difficult, and uh, I was just wondering what. What are some of the solutions that you had for dealing with, for example, a, a file not being downloaded, file not being downloaded fully? How do you handle, what are algorithms that you use to, to handle those sorts of things? Well, it's, you know, it's a hard question. As I always told my students, it depends. It, it, it depends on your requirements. Uh, uh, if you're NSEP, and, and I, don't, I don't know how they, they do this, then, then your requirements are pretty high. And then you need to start thinking about uh, redundancy, you know, maybe. And, and in fact, NSEP does this. They have two computer systems that run their models every day, and they can automatically swap over if necessary. And and and, and they're in different locations. That you know, that's an extreme case um, when you're somebody like me who's running models, and, and you want them to run most of the time, just so you're not embarrassed. Um, uh, the, the you you take some risks, and 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 like. For example, bringing in th this MetGrid process I, I was telling you about, where you need some certain input data, we make the decision that, OK, if the data isn't there, if we can't fetch it, well, we probably successfully fetched the previous six hours of data. And so we can use that. The results are going to be less accurate, but you know, it's something. And it depends. It really depends on the requirements. I have kind of a follow up on this. So as uh your framework or what you've done already something embedded that okay well it depends but you have the choice and you just flip a switch and say okay well I have a redundancy here or I wait uh, X or I don't or I use that one that you know just a flip because oftentimes we have two problems one is thinking and making the right choice and that one is programming the choice, mm -hmm. which then turns out to be wrong. But since we have spent a lot of effort for doing it, we kind of insist that's right because you know we have invested time on making it and we don't want to uh, set that to the drain. Whereas if you have a framework that will make it easy to switch from one policy to another, it just no effort, just flip that switch. Sure, which is more expensive. And, and 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 that's it's it's just full of trade-offs. It's uh, yeah, you know, ideally, ideally we have four multiple systems running running all the time, and and when something goes wrong, we we can just switch to the other, and we get our data from multiple sources and such. But uh, you just you just have to start making sacrifices somewhere in there. And you know, our time is limited. Our, our resources are limited. So when I see the seamless uh, cloud computing, I, I wonder, I mean, OpenStack seems to be kind of the, the framework that a lot of people are using for doing that sort of thing. And I'm, I, I don't know if Python has nice ways to use OpenStack or if that's applicable to what you're talking about or whether. I'm just beginning to explore this. Um, my thoughts have been actually to, to look at something more, ma more mainstream first, you know, the Google and Amazon, just to understand the process and then um, look look more in depth. So I, I don't know at this point. Yeah, I think OpenStack is pretty mainstream at this point, but okay. and, and abstracts and, and extends. But, you but know, makes it sure allows you to use you, to set up your own clusters or to use a commodity cluster. And anyway, uh, it's something to look at. But I don't know kind of 
I'm curious now to think how Python fits into you know, it, how it, it leverages all that. It, uh, do you know of, of commercial groups who are, are, are making resources available through OpenStack? Or, well, or I think Rackspace is, is behind it big time, and Rackspace has Google a is? Rackspace. Oh, OK. Um, and so, well, I, uh, OpenStack allows you to use uh, Amazon AWS. It u allows you to use oh. uh, other systems. It also allows you to use and, and deploy your own cluster okay. and to move things back and forth. And it has file system pieces. So and it's a level above scheduling pieces. Their, their interfaces, so to speak. Um, a, a kind of a level above, but also kind of a re-implementation of some of the um, the AP, uh, compatible with, but also um, uh, more flexible than. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, it, it seems um, to be quite the thing in, in those circles. And so I'm just I wondering. I will be looking into that. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's thanks our speaker once again. Yes, thank you.